What on earth is this monstrosity? Over the last few years on this channel, we have looked at various gaming hardware oddities. The majority of you will be more than familiar with the rise of the Nintendo Entertainment System and the popularity of the Sega Master System, but what about the Dido family game? Yeah, but I didn't think you would have seen this one before, that's why when a console popped up on eBay displaying a similar form factor to the NES and a box that looks like that of a Sega Master System, I couldn't resist purchasing it so that I could try and learn a bit more about it. So with all that said, join me today as we look at the system that resembles the illegitimate love child of the two 8-bit game consoles that dominated during the late 80s and early 90s. I am Lady Decade and this is uncovering the mystery of the illegal Dido family game. During the 80s and early 90s, Nintendo's 8-bit home console hardware dominated the gaming industry, setting new sales records and outselling all previous video game systems. However, whether you were playing the Famicom in Japan or the NES in the United States, the console and its games came with a hefty price tag. Many individuals in working-class America often chose to rent titles from Blockbuster rather than purchase them, as gaming was an expensive pastime, especially with Nintendo charging a premium for their products. This meant that during this period in history, Nintendo games were only popular in countries with extremely developed economies. For the majority of planet Earth's residents though, Nintendo products were either too costly, challenging to obtain, or a combination of both, compounded further by the fact that Nintendo did not even bother to operate in most markets, as they didn't see people spending out sums of money on luxury goods like their premium price to consumer electronics. But while there was and is a huge wealth divide between the United States and close to every other country on Earth, by the 90s there were breakthroughs in technology that allowed Nintendo games to reach a much wider audience. I am, of course, referring to the birth of Famiclones. That's right, Nintendo titles were finally widely available to be enjoyed and experienced beyond simply the few wealthiest spoilt brat hotspots on the planet, which was all thanks to the glorious magic of reverse engineering and the wonderful people they refer to as video game pirates. No longer was Mario only for the top 10% of the wealthiest citizens on Earth, but he was for everyone to enjoy. As they say in Soviet Russia, these are our games. Speaking of Russia, this is the region where the Dendi branded Famiclones would become popular, a brand that, due to the mysterious nature of Russia, combines the facts Russian speakers uploaded nostalgia pieces on these during the early days of YouTube, has meant that Dendi has captivated the imagination of the West, leading to the existence of the Dendi Elephant logo becoming a part of gaming trivia as common as Did You Know Super Mario Bros 2 is really Doki Doki Panic. As interesting as it was for all of us to learn about an alternative history whereby some of the citizens of Russia believed that Nintendo games were Dendi games, what is even more interesting to me is that the Dendi is just one of hundreds of different distributors across the globe who were all playing an active role in this grey market, profiting from selling unlicensed versions of Nintendo products on the cheap. So while the Russian gaming story has been heavily explored over the years, most of the other regional Famiclone stories have been barely touched on. Something on YouTube I'm actively trying to change. Previously on here, we have already looked at the story of the Pegasus, the epic and impressive rise of Famiclones in Poland, and we have spotlighted the Chinese-produced Ending Man Terminator, one of the most prolific Famiclone brands of all time. In fact, we have even looked at the Star Trek II, an extremely quirky designed unit, with all evidence pointing towards the fact that it received a decent amount of distribution in Greece. Keeping in mind that it seems that Famiclones eventually 
eventually became far more widespread than NESs themselves, it quickly begins to become clear to us as to why Nintendo are so terrified of piracy. With so many weird and wonderful devices out there that vary from region to region, this means there are rich subcultures of nostalgic gamers out there who each have an affinity for a model or brand of Famiclone due to a particular one becoming the dominant gaming hardware in a region. Which probably raises the question to you all, which region are we covering today? As for the Dido video family game, I purchased this interesting looking device from right here in the United Kingdom, but when we take into account that piracy laws here have always been pretty strict in this country, it probably becomes no surprise to you at all that this clearly isn't the nation where this platform was originally sold within. Sadly, performing a Google search to research this system doesn't draw many results at all, with no wiki pages in existence out there providing even the most simple breakdown regarding the history of this hardware. However, a few tweets can be located that provide us with an outline regarding this mysterious machine's origins. A Twitter user by the name of Retro NES Club tweeted out some images of a Famiclone, but not the model we are spotlighting today. It reads, when translated into English, that this Christmas season many children received a hashtag Nippondo. It was a hashtag NES clone console that is a hashtag Hashtag Famiclone, which was a very popular in Spain. It came with a multi-game cartridge and pistol. It was compatible with pirated and official games from all regions. You got it? No, I don't have it. Just all of these weird things. While this isn't the Dido family game, can we take a minute to appreciate the name Nippondo? After all, it's a portmanteau of Nintendo and the Japanese word for Japan. It's just such a perfect name for one of these bootleg systems, particularly when we take into account that these Nippondos do not have a Famicom slot like most Famiclones, but instead a slot for NES games, which raises the question, why? Well, unlike in other places such as the Eastern Bloc, Spain was a country where the NES was indeed released, and as early as in 1987 in fact, a few years before Famicom technology even existed yet. In fact, I even happen to have a Spanish NES right here with the console being clearly labelled Spanish Edition on the front. So why did Spain have a bootleg NES and the real deal simultaneously, you may wonder. The late 1980s and early 1990s were a period of significant economic and political change in Spain. Spain has recently transitioned to a democratic system of government following the death of General Francisco Franco in 1970. This transition created a more stable and open political environment, which had a positive impact on the country's economic prospects. Spain also became a member of the European Economic Community in 1986, which later evolved into the European Union. Spain attracted a considerable amount of foreign direct investment during this period, particularly in sectors like telecommunications, energy and finance. Foreign companies saw Spain as an attractive market due to its growing economy and EU membership. Spain invested heavily in infrastructure development, including the expansion and modernization of its transportation networks. This included the construction of high-speed rail lines and major highway projects, improving connectivity both domestically and internationally, with tourism also continuing to be a significant driver of the Spanish economy during this time. So there was certainly enough money floating around in Spain for many consumers to have been able to afford a real NES. But why bother when you legally didn't have to? The history of video game piracy laws in Spain is a complex and evolving one. Like many countries, Spain has had to adapt its legal framework to address the challenges posed by video game piracy over the years. In the late 80s and early 90s in Spain, there were limited legal provisions specifically addressing video game piracy. As a result, piracy of video games was relatively common in Spain during this period, with unauthorized copies of games and consoles being widely available in the market. This would all slowly change, as by the late 90s, Spain began to implement international agreements and treaties related to intellectual property rights, including those pertaining to video games. This marked a shift towards a stricter enforcement of copyright laws. But before all of this came to fruition, the laws allowed products such as Nippondos to flourish. 
But what about the Dido family game? Was this sold in Spain too? Well, according to some responses from that tweet from Retro NES Club, yes. Another poster with the username WKR replied and stated that he owned a Dido 3700, with them showing off pictures of the very same console and box that I have right here. Another user chimes in and says that they had one too, which their father purchased for them, which made them the happiest child in the world. WKR responds with their own nostalgia, with them also commenting that it must not have been very well known. In fact, I don't know anyone who has it. Of course, I remember that it cost me 15,000 pesetas back then, my first salary as an intern. Well, now WKR, if you see this, you know of at least one other person who has one. Of course, while this anecdotal Spanish nostalgia regarding the Dido is interesting, we can only learn so much about the hardware that way. So let's now go one step further and perform an unboxing so we can look at this Famiclone up close and personal. Let's do it! Right, here we go. Oh, that's a bit damaged. Loud noises! I hate that noise. So we've got the system itself, actual NES ports as well. That says to me that maybe the controllers would actually work in an NES, so that might be an interesting experiment to do. Look at the difference in size. This is so much smaller. It definitely sounds different. Right. On the back, we've got an eject button as well. It's interesting. Got the instruction manual. That does look like a Famicom controller, but we've got two turbo buttons. Second one. Oh, that's interesting. Is it? It's got a picture of a Coleco vision on it. I wonder if that's what was supposed to be in the box or not. I have no idea. But yes, you can turn that to antenna and you can turn that to game. Tell me in the comment section what you think of the design of this. Now we have the unboxing out of the way, let me show you one of my favourite features of this model of Famicom, its quirky eject button. You insert an NES cartridge into the device, much like how you would insert bread into a toaster, and as the game is inserted, the eject button on the back pops out of the system. Applying pressure to it allows games to satisfying pop out of the front, leading this to, in my opinion, being one of the cooler designed Famiclones. Dido also distributed these converters to allow us to insert Famicom form factor games into the family game, and this additional converter that was created so that NES-shaped games work in Famicoms and Famicom-inspired Famiclones. In fact, after doing some research online, it seems that Dido produced Famiclones that look like Famicoms as well as their NES-shaped devices. So thus far on my quest to learn everything there is to know about these weird grey market consoles, it's been fun to track down and learn about some of the murky past surrounding the Dido family game. Sadly, there is not a great amount of information online written about this odd platform, but at least all of us have had the opportunity to have an up-close look at it and even hear some first-hand nostalgic memories about it from its home market of Spain. However, like with many of these mysterious machines, I would love it if there are some of you watching at home who can fill in even more of the gaps. So, if you grew up with a Dido family game, please share your personal nostalgic story down below as it would be cool to hear some more personal experiences from those who enjoyed this oddity. If you enjoyed this upload, check out my Star Trek episode now. May the Force be with you, always. <laughs>